Section 9 of The Romance of Polar Exploration. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Polar Exploration by G. Firth Scott. Chapter 7 Peary in Greenland. The disaster and suffering which characterized the termination of the Greeley and Polaris expeditions did not tend to recommend Arctic exploration as a national enterprise to the government of the United States. A vast amount of highly valuable information had been obtained not only by these expeditions, but also by the expedition sent out by the British government under the command of Sir George Nares. And in addition to the information, a further knowledge had been gained, the knowledge that the same spirit of indomitable pluck, the same tireless energy, and the same loyalty and devotion to duty dominated both branches of the great English-speaking race. The magnificent heroism displayed by the explorers from the alert and discovery found a parallel in the later experiences and exploits of the American expeditions, and both British and American governments felt that, for a time at least, they were justified in resting on the laurels their gallant sons had won. But if the governments were satisfied, the restless spirit of the race could not remain quiet, while secrets still remained in the keeping of the frozen north. The Pole was still untouched, and, more than that, there were secrets to be wrested from localities not quite so remote. The discoveries along the north coast of Greenland opened up the very interesting question whether the land did not extend right up to the Pole itself. As far as anyone had penetrated to the north of the coast, land was still to be seen farther on. It was an open question whether this great ice-covered country was an island with its northern shores swept by the polar ice flows, or whether it extended almost to the dimensions of a continent in the polar region. The problem appealed strongly to two explorers whose names, by reason of their exploits during recent years, have become familiar. They are Nansen and Peary. The former, by his dash for the pole, during which he surpassed all previous records of the farthest north, has dwarfed his Greenland performances. The latter, by his journey of 1,300 miles over the ice-crowned interior of Greenland, decided the insular character of the country. It is that journey which forms the subject of this chapter. Lieutenant Robert E. Peary, an officer in the engineering department of the United States Navy, failing to obtain government support for his scheme of an overland journey to the northern coast of Greenland, was supported by the Philadelphia Academy of National Science. The expedition was necessarily small, but that did not affect its utility. It was, moreover, unique by the inclusion of Lieutenant Peary's wife as one of its members. The account which she has given of her sojourn in high latitudes is one of the most interesting of books on the Arctic regions. The party left New York on June 6, 1891, on board the steamer Kite for Whale Sound on the northwest coast of Greenland. The voyage was satisfactory in every way until June 24, when an unfortunate accident befell the leader. The kite had encountered some ice, which was heavy enough to check her progress, and, to get through it, the captain had to ram his ship. This necessitated a constant change from going ahead to going astern, and as there was a good deal of loose ice floating about, the rudder frequently came into collision with it when the vessel was backing. Lieutenant Peary, who was on deck during one of these maneuvers, went over to the wheelhouse to see how the rudder was bearing the strain. As he stood behind the wheelhouse, the rudder struck a heavy piece of ice and was forcibly jerked over, the tiller as it swung catching Lieutenant Peary by the leg and pinning him against the wall of the house. 
there was no escape from the position and the pressure of the tiller gradually increased until the bone of the leg snapped the doctor who formed one of the party immediately set the limb but the sufferer refused to return home and when a few days later the kite reached mccormick bay he was carried ashore strapped to a plank the material for a comfortably sized house was part of the outfit of the expedition and this was in course of erection the day that lieutenant peary was landed for the accommodation of himself and wife a tent was put up behind the half-completed house and as a high wind arose the remainder of the party returned on board the kite as the hours passed away the wind became stronger the tent swayed to and fro and mrs peary as she sat beside her invalid and sleeping husband realized what it was to be lonely and helpless she and her husband were the only people on shore for miles her husband was unable to move and she was without even a revolver with which to defend herself what she asked herself would be the result if a bear came into the tent she could not make the people on board the kite hear and she was without a weapon throughout the stay in the north mrs peary proved herself not only to be a woman of strong nerve and self-reliance but also an excellent shot with either gun rifle or revolver it was however as much as she could stand when her anxious ears caught the sound of heavy breathing outside the tent for a time she sat still fearing to disturb her husband until the continuance of the sound compelled her to look out a school of white whales were playing close inshore and it was the noise of their blowing softened by the wind which had so disturbed her but so self-possessed was she over it that her husband did not know till long afterwards the anxiety she had experienced during the first night she spent on the greenland shore the following day rapid progress was made with the house and some of the party stayed on shore for the night so that there was always someone within call of the invalid's tent until the house was completed and he was removed into it by that time the kite had started home again and the little party of seven were left to make all their arrangements for the winter they had determined to rely entirely upon their own exertions for the supply of meat for the winter and also to obtain their fur clothing on the spot killing the animals necessary for the material and engaging some of the local eskimo to make up the suits deer would give both meat and fur and as there was every prospect of the neighborhood affording them in plenty as soon as the house was up and the stores packed the majority started away in search of game the spot where they were landed and where they had erected their camp was on a verdure covered slope lying between the sea and the high range of bluff hills which towered about one thousand feet over them in the spring the ground was covered with grass and flowers the bay in front was full of seal walrus whales and other marine inhabitants and along the hills behind experience showed that game was present in abundance the eta eskimo the most northerly people in existence lived their quaint out-of-the-world lives along the shores of the bay and neighboring inlets and as soon as the camp was settled they were kept busily employed in the making of fur garments proving themselves docile and peaceful it was often difficult for the members of the expedition to realize that the sight of their camp with the abundance of food to be had was only from fifty to eighty miles from the spots where the castaways of the polaris suffered so acutely and the members of the greeley expedition slowly starved many of them to death for more than a year the little party of seven lived in good health without a suggestion of scurvy making its appearance and with only one fatality which moreover was accidental the first hunting expedition was in search of deer and everybody took part in it except the leader who was still crippled by his injured leg and confined to his room and his wife 
for two or three days the hunters were away for they were fortunate in discovering a herd of deer which they followed until all were bagged then with as many as they could convey leaving the others to be fetched later they set out for the camp their approach was duly signalled and upon hearing that they were returning laden lieutenant peary for the first time hobbled out of the house on crutches as they came up he rested on one leg and his crutches while he photographed them and their trophies after which the double occasion was celebrated by a banquet in which venison played an important part the deer skins were very important additions to the stock of material from which the winter clothing was to be made but other varieties were needed especially of the marine animals as well as some native tailors to fashion them into coats hoods mittens and all the other articles of arctic wear a boat party was therefore dispatched along the shores of inglefield gulf to spy out the localities where walrus was to be found and to induce some of the natives of a village seen from the kite to come over to the camp and sew the new garments the party was successful in both instances for a number of walrus were seen and an eskimo family came back by the boat the huskies consisted of a man his wife and two little children and they moved with all their belongings they were little people under five feet in height and almost as broad as they were long clad in fur jumpers and short breeches with sealskin boots reaching over their knees the costume of both adults was very similar the only practical difference being in the tunic or jumper that of the woman having the hood longer and deeper for the accommodation of her infant they had broad good-natured faces not especially handsome nor intelligent in appearance but distinctly dirty in fact the use of water other than for drinking did not appear to be known to the primitive people and it was very much a question whether they had ever tried the experiment of a wash once mrs peary was tempted to give one of the little ones a bath and she records how intensely amazed it was at being put into the water although it was more than two years old surviving the shock however it manifested its pleasure by lustily kicking and splashing perhaps later it enjoyed a well-merited honor amongst its own people as the only one of the tribe who ever passed through the extraordinary ordeal of soap and water in consequence of their innocence of water as a cleansing medium the huskies as the peary party affectionately termed them had two very distinguishing characteristics not entirely pleasing to more civilized people they carried around with them a distinctly impressive aroma and also thriving colonies of what are politely termed parasites in the matter of clothes they carry their wardrobes on their backs fur garments do not wear out very rapidly and when a husky is full grown the suit of clothes made in honor of the event remains in constant wear until one of two things happens if the man kills a bear he has a costume made of the skin and discards the ordinary sealskin suit for it if he does not kill a bear he wears the sealskin suit until it no longer keeps him warm when he gets another in their snow houses during the winter and storms if the temperature is too warm for them in their thick clothing they take the clothing off being a primitive people their manners are as simple as their minds the first arrivals at the peary camp were however very useful people there being no trees in this far northern region and wood consequently being one of their most valued treasures they were for some time unable to comprehend how so much timber had been acquired to build the house when they saw a fire made in the stove of refuse bits of wood they were still more amazed never before had they seen so much fire all at once and the man growing curious kept on feeling the stove to see what the effect would be when it was hot enough to burn his hand he developed a wholesome respect for it and preferred to regard the to him uncanny object from a distance 
the problem of how the sewing was to be done was rather a difficult one to the white people for a time to allow the furs to be taken into the eskimo tent was to invite the introduction of an insect population of which it would be impossible to get rid later on the other hand to allow the huskies to enter the house too frequently was equally dangerous from the sanitary point of view a compromise was effected by the eskimo woman doing the sewing near the door of the house with some one always keeping an eye on her later on when it was found that little danger existed from the spread of insects if reasonable care were taken the workers sat inside the house they were fairly deft in handling the needle and the suits they made for the party were all excellent and serviceable these were made on the native pattern and the experience of lieutenant peary and his comrade astrup in their journey over the great ice cap proved that the native pattern was the best when the woman was set to work a boat expedition in search of walrus was organized with the eskimo as guide lieutenant peary and his wife also going they had not proceeded very many miles up inglefield gulf before a light breeze when they saw on a floating piece of ice a dozen or so of the animals huddled together apparently asleep sailing gently towards them every one with a rifle ready a sudden puff of wind sent the boat ahead quicker and farther than was intended and it struck the ice the walrus never having seen a sailing boat before looked round at it without paying any more attention than if it had been another piece of ice but the sight of so many valuable creatures within reach of his harpoon was too much for the little eskimo and he buried the weapon into the nearest at once the attitude of the walrus changed the wounded member of the tribe tried to escape bellowing in its pain and the rest slid off the ice into the water and surrounded the boat others from neighboring ice patches charged rapidly on to the scene and the situation of the boat and its occupants was dangerous in the extreme the poor eskimo his face showing the terror he felt crouched down in the boat evidently expecting to be annihilated by the furious animals that surged round as they came up to the boat they tried to get their great powerful tusks over the gunwales and had one succeeded in doing so there would have been slight hopes of anyone escaping had the boat been capsized no one could possibly have survived and to keep the angry crowd off was no easy matter all around they swarmed and not less than two hundred and fifty were estimated to be engaged in the attack lieutenant peary with his injured leg sat in the stern of the boat firing at them and the other white men also kept up a fusillade mrs peary again giving evidence of her strong nerve and courage sitting beside her husband and loading the weapons as soon as they were emptied the walrus came on in bunches to the attack and immediately they were fired at all those nearest to the boat leaped out of the water and then plunged out of sight there was always the danger of one of the huge creatures rising under the boat and so capsizing it but the occupants had no time to think of this directly one batch jumped and disappeared another batch hastened forward to greet the volley of bullets in the same way as the others and be in turn succeeded by another batch the boat was meanwhile gradually approaching the shore and as the water became more shallow the walrus exhibited less desire to come to close quarters until at last the adventurers found that they had beaten off the last of the swarm the main body had retreated far up the gulf only a few remaining near several of those which had been shot however were floating on the surface of the water and it was decided to go back and secure them even at the risk of another attack already some of them were sinking 